Okay, so I'm going to, like you suggested, uh, uh, present the, the Planck HFI systematics and, and uh, maybe give you some hints about uh, things that are, um, first, how we corrected the data and things that, that the, the systematics that dominate actually uh, even after correction. And this is lesson learned also for, for future experiments. Uh, like light bird. So let me just summarize actually the main points uh, of, uh, of this. Um, so first, the, the main lessons for, for, from Planck, I would say, um, that analysis and cleaning was, was a very long process and uh, we, we, we needed uh, many, many iterations, few years of iterations actually to improve the processing. And this, is, this was due to uh, many uh, unknown effects uh, before the lunch, right? So we discovered uh, many systematics actually uh, during the lunch. Um, the precision for the calibration, uh, the detector calibration was 10 to the minus four. So it's, we required actually a very good cal calibration in order to measure the polarization in particular. Um, at the end of the whole process, uh, we managed to reach the detector noise, actually a fundamental limit. Um, uh, cosmological channels, even if this fundamental noise is actually uh, was actually at the level which we didn't completely expect uh, at the beginning of the mission, and I'm going to comment on that. Um, as I said, uh, some systematics were not expected uh, uh, in Planck uh, before lunch, and in particular, ADC nonlinearity. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, discuss that a little bit uh, at the end of my talk. Um, but ADC nonlinearities were actually the dominant uh, systematic effect, and it's the dominant systematic effect at the end. Uh, and it leads to uh, actually uh, temperature to polarization leakage. So that's the main, main problem. Um, there were some long time constants in uh, detector long time constants which are not expected. Um, the response to cosmic rays uh, wasn't expected. Uh, and there, there was an unknown uh, one of earth noise I was talking, I was mentioning at the beginning. And we didn't expect such a bandpass mismatch leading also to uh, temperature to polarization leakage. So I've put in red here the, the main problem, I would say. Uh, and the main problem was that there was a coupling between some effects, and in particular the 4K lines. The, 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 you know, the, the compressor uh, vibration or microphonics line that appear on detector. And the, this was coupled with ADC nonlinearities, ADC problems. Uh, the coupling of the two, the cocktail of the two effects was, was really uh, the limitation or easily read the limitation. And the uh, last point here, um, uh, in the last points I, I I, I mentioned the uh, dominant systematics at the end of the mission after cleaning. And like I said, ADC, uh, ADC residuals were the limiting, uh, limiting uh, effects at the end. Uh, there were some uh, residual bond pass mismatches which were improved uh, during the, the, for the 2018 uh, analysis. Uh, there was a polarization efficiency problem um, improved in 2018 and also beam mismatches improved in 2018. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to go fast on that. So for future mission, obviously targeting uh, sigma R of 10 to the minus three, uh, systematic, systematic effect will have to be clean at a much higher uh, precision than for Planck. Although uh, actually uh, many effects uh, will uh, scale like uh, one over the number of detectors. Yeah, there, were, there were many effects. If you take, for example, ADC nonlinearities, which hopefully won't be present for light burn, uh, those ADC, the effect of ADC nonlinearities were actually uh, different from detector to detector. So you could, you could, you could have actually a, a decrease of the total effect of uh, scaling like one over n. Um, also, a scaling strategy with more angle, uh, more redundancies of angles will, uh, will help, obviously. Uh, this is, it will be the case for light burn in particular. Um, uh, importance of, uh, so this, I'm stressing here the importance of redundancies, uh, which was a kind of a problem with Planck because we only had, a, we, we had a small precession angle, which means um, only a few angles, scanning angle uh, available. 
Um, the 353 channel was harder to process, and actually, uh, it is a key, key channel, as you know, for component separation or for future surveys or for combining uh, with other experiments. And actually, uh, um, a lot of systematics remain actually for the 353 uh, gigahertz uh, channel. We rely a lot on the dipole as a calibrator for systematic effects. Um, and also, I should stress the importance of housekeeping data. In particular, uh, we had measurements of uh, raw uh, data from uh, uh, ADC. Uh, it allowed, actually, a correction of the ADC. Um, many uh, effects as band pass mismatch, sorry, polarization efficiency, uh, calibration uh, uh, are coupled and need to be corrected at the map making level. So, uh, with the help of the dipole, the dipole, as I said, helped a lot. So uh, we, at the end of the mission, we moved. So if you compare the analysis from the beginning of the mission to the end of the mission, we moved to uh, some uh, individual treatments for individual systematics to um, uh, join some kind of joint studies. So uh, here I'm promoting actually joint studies and you are in Oslo, you are on the top of things on this, but uh, this is, um, it was really important to have joint studies in order to clean efficiently the, you know, the data. And we started to do that in Planck, but not in a, uh, not sufficiently, I would say. Okay. Let me move to the next slide if I can. Yeah, okay. So I wrote some model and also I know that you, you did similar things in your group, um, but I wrote some model of the data uh, just illustrating the, the complexity of the, of the data. And actually uh, writing a model is very useful complete model is very useful to identify uh, the different, different parameters and the, the different parameters you need to estimate. And you have a lot of, you, you have a lot of unknowns actually in, the, in this model. So I don't, I, I'm not going to, to detail everything, but you know, um, this is, a simula, this is a, sorry, modeling the electronics response here, uh, the, uh, uh, some additive effects like glitches, uh, uh, fork lines, um, and you have to be very careful on where those additive eff effects apply, if they are convolved with the electronic response or not, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, the, 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 the signal here is also, uh, has also a transfer function with, which is related to the detector time constants. Uh, it is convolved with, a, a AC, with an asymmetric beam, uh, polarized beam eventually, etc. cetera. So it's, it's very uh, complex uh, model. Um, also, I should say that this is a simplification because the real, I would say, uh, um, th th there are some approximations actually uh, in this in this expression. Even if I try to to be as general as possible, uh, let me comment about the ADC later. But the goal actually in Planck was to clean the data such that you have a model here, which actually a very simple model of uh, symmetrized lob. Uh, which, which is convolving the signal plus, plus noise. But obviously it's very, very difficult to reach that uh, by cleaning the data. So if I, if I um, comment on the, one of the main problem of Planck, it was the cosmic rays. You heard about it. We had many cosmic rays, galactic cosmic rays coming to the detectors or coming to the different components of the focal plane, um, right? It's mostly protons and helium, helium nuclei. Um, so you, you see, you see the spectrum, the, the spectrum of galactic uh, protons, galactic helium, etc., um, which is peaking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, at some uh, some energy which is around uh, one uh, uh, giga electron electron volt. Um, actually, uh, due to the the different components around the satellite, there was uh, some kind of cut in this spectrum. So the the, the, the particles with a lower energy that typically 50 MeV. Uh, did, did not penetrate to the detectors, okay? But the other ones, they, they penetrated to the detectors. Um, we could see um, this uh, huge uh, impact of cosmic ray by, by uh, looking the temperature of the focal plane. And actually this is the temperature of the focal plane in here, which is uh, completely uh, correlated with, uh, with actually the, so, so this is along the mission you see in time here. Uh, in days, actually, right? So this is this is varying like this. This is a one over f squared type spectrum, and actually it's drifting here. And this is due to the change of uh, number of heat of cosmic rays uh, during the mission. So it's 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 really hundred percent correlated with that. 
So we had many uh, thermal fluctuations of the focal, focal plane due to the fluctuations of the number of heat of cosmic rays. Okay. Let me go to the next slide. So, um, like I said, we had many uh, glitches at the detector level. So the, you can see one PSB uh, polarization sensitive uh, bolometer. So it's two uh, two grids which are orthogonal. And you, you can see in black here, this is a, a small wafer. Um, and the grid is actually, you, you cannot see very well the grid, but it's attached to this wafer. There is a thermal link between the two. And you have the, the crystal here, uh, which measured actually the, the temperature, temperature change due to photons coming. We had many cosmic rays coming here. We had cosmic rays falling directly on the grid, directly on the thermistor, and directly on the on the wafer, and actually we had many events on the wafer. You can see why it's a big surface, actually, um, which is connected to the grid with some uh, you know some time constants. And actually, you can see uh, different categories of glitches depending on where they fall. It's very easy to identify those. So you can see the different categories in there. The fast ones, the short ones, it's only a fast response. You can see in second here. Um, you can see uh, uh, examples of two glitches, um, two, two different categories of short, short glitches actually that we identified, but they are fast, fast decay, fast rise, fast decay. They just fall on the thermistor or the grid. But we had those long events, long events with a fast component and a slow decaying component. And the slow decaying component is due, I mean, those, those events that just fall actually on the wafer here. And uh, it takes time to decay just because it takes time for the energy to leave the wafer. Okay. And you can see the time constants actually of this is about a few seconds. So this is very annoying. And this, this is pretty high amplitude as compared to the peak of the glitch. The fast component we understood later was due to ballistic phonons coming, you know, when uh, an event penetrates, hits the wafer, you have some ballistic phonons. Which, uh, which actually, uh, you know, hit the uh, the grid and the thermistor. So this is pretty fast rise, fast decay, but then you are left with a thermal component due to the the the, the global uh, heat of the of the wafer here. Okay, and the the the, sec the few seconds time time constant is due is you is is the time needed for the energy to leave actually the wafer. Okay, so we understood that a posteriori, obviously. We didn't know that before flight. Um, we re rely on glitches to really understand how the bolometer works, because if you try to build a model from, uh, you know, the different components of the, the, uh, the bolometer, you have so many uh, boxes, so many components, so many links, thermal possible, term um, possible links, and we didn't know the time constants before flight. It was not measured very accurately. We didn't know the time constant. We didn't know much the capacity. So it was difficult, extremely difficult to, to, to know the profile uh, and to, to expect the profile for glitches before flight. That, that was the main problem. We had to remove extensively a cosmic rays, actually, uh, from the data. And it was a main problem for a while. You can see a piece of data with many, many cosmic rays because it's a, it's a big uh, cross section, you know, uh, the wafer. Uh, and actually uh, you can see the long tails. This is a pretty high amplitude glitches, glitch, but you have another one in here where you can see the tail and you have different components. It was very difficult analysis because we had to fit for each detected event if it belongs to a long glitch or short glitches and we had to remove actually the tails as you can see here, this is a fitted, fitted tails basically. We had to remove that, right? Otherwise, you, you are left with uh, this excess noise at low frequency. If you don't do anything, if you just uh, flag the fast part, you are left with a long tail and you are left with uh, excess noise in the power spectrum. So this is a TOD, TOI power spectrum. And after cleaning, uh, after uh, cleaning of the data, uh, we, we got does uh, the spectra for the di for different detectors here at 143 gigahertz so it was pretty efficient but it took a long time to reach that many iterations i don't i don't go into details but 
you know, uh, the difficulty was also to remove the signal because if you fit those things without removing carefully the signal, you bias your signal, obviously, right? Because you always remove a positive signal. So you will bias your signal, positive signal as compared to negative signal. So we had to iterate between signal estimation on the map and a cleaning of, uh, of the tails. So it was a pretty uh, uh, complex, actually, and uh, complex analysis. So this is the power spectrum after cleaning. In black, you can see the power spectrum of TOI, power spe TOD power spectrum after cleaning, after glitch cleaning for different detectors. In, uh, in red, you have a common mode for all detectors, which was due to, like I mentioned before, those thermal fluctuations of the focal plane due to, again to glitches falling on the focal plane. Okay, but we are we were left with that. It's very it's common to all detectors, as you can see here. If you remove this uh, this red uh, line, so this common mode, you are left with the green one. And actually, the, in the green one, we, you, you have some one of ref noise, which is this time uncorrelated between detectors. And up to now, we never understood. I mean, even up to now, we <laughs> we never understood this um, excess noise, which was not seen on the ground. So we we had this uh, this uh, remaining one of ref noise, which was the limitation uh, after. Okay. So the, the new frequency of this of this excess noise, one of ref noise, is, is 0 0.5, 0 0.15 hertz. So it's pretty high new frequency. I have several arguments um, why this is not due to glitches. So, but I'm not going to, except if you have questions, I'm not going to mention that now. So, glitches helped a lot actually for many aspects of the analysis because you know, with so many glitches, you can uh, actually identify some uh, time constants of the detectors. Like I said, it's a probe actually of detectors. So, if you are able to model the different components of the detector, you can uh, actually learn about time constants. And this is what we did. Comparing the different populations of glitches, we we saw those very long time constants, actually a few second time constants, and actually they were seen also in the signal later by looking the galactic plane. So and also looking the dipole, because those very long time constants they actually shift the dipole in one direction when you scan it. When you come back six months later, you shift the, the dipole in another direction with the two scannings. Right, so this is an illustration in here. You have the dipole is moving in one direction or another direction, depending on the scanning direction, due to those very long time constants. We could see that. We could see the distortion in the dipole. So the, the, the glitches help actually to, uh, to, to identify uh, those time constants. Let me jump, uh, let me go faster because I don't have much time. Um, just um, what I want to say is that uh, uh, I want to comment about remaining uh, remaining uh, systematic, the main systematic effect, but I already mentioned that a bit. So there were uh, additive effects like the glitch, the unexpected one of noise, microphonic noise, which is the 4K lines I mentioned before, and a few uh, multiplicative one or, 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 or systematic effect that mixed I and P intensity and polarization components, in particular IDC nonlinearities, mount pass mismatch, and long time constants. Okay. Um, there were other systematics uh, like the beam, the combination and beam and time constants and polar polarization efficiencies. Um, the use of redundancies was very useful. Uh, obviously, you know that if you have many redundancies of the, on the data, you can uh, actually uh, break the degeneracies and fit systematics and fit parameters. I, I, I gave you the example of uh, the six months, the survey six months apart, right? You scan in one direction and you come back six months later, you scan in another direction. If you have some long time constants, you can fit those, right? On the galaxy in particular. This is illustrated by this map, right? So this is a jackknife map. After removing, you know, you remove six months the data after creation six, six months apart, you see a lot of residuals <laughs> in this. Uh, this is before correction from long time constants. Actually, you can see what happens in the galactic plane, right? You shift a little bit the signal in one direction and you shift 
the other six months apart signal in, in the other direction, you are left with a difference. Okay, so you can have a global method actually, which fits those components, fits those parameters by minimizing, minimizing the mismatch between uh, different surveys. Okay, so that's typically what we did. Let me talk rapidly about, uh, about uh, the beam systematics. So I'm talking here about the main beam systematics and actually the degeneracy, the transfer function of detectors, right? So you have a complete degeneracy between time constant and beams. Um, you can break that degeneracy by uh, looking the, uh, uh, by, by symmetrizing the beam particular because the, you know, the time constant effect is only in the scanning direction while the beam is in 2D. Um, so you can, um, you can actually uh, distinguish the two by uh, maximizing the, uh, the symmetry of the beam. If you have an asymmetric beam, uh, then you are in trouble to separate the two. Um, we, you can also break the degeneracy uh, using the different bias steps, which were done in the early phase of the mission by changing, you know, the, make, uh, putting some steps in the data, you can fit some, uh, some time, time constant this way. But it was a complex, uh, it was a difficult operation. Uh, I should say that uh, all of this was limited by glitches again. And the reason is we had so many glitches, so many glitches falling everywhere that the efficiency of the glitching was not the same in uh, while scanning planets to estimate the beam as compared to the rest of the data. The reason, the reason is due to a huge signal and huge gradients. Um, which because of that we, ha we had to hire a little bit the threshold for the detection of glitches. And as a result, you bias a little bit your signal while scanning the beam. And then you have a wrong uh, estimation of the beam. So wrong estimation of the trans transfer function and you have some bias at the end in cosmology. So we had to, in data, we had to fit actually uh, the transfer function or to, to make some correction of the transfer function at the likelihood optimization stage. The main reason, as I say, this is really uh, glitches. Let's, let me finish with ADC correction. I, I still have a few minutes, so what, um, how, how long do I have? Uh, you have about five minutes. So five minutes, okay. Yeah, but uh, the, okay. the next speaker also isn't on yet, and it's 7 a.m. this time, so maybe, uh, maybe a little stalling wouldn't be the worst thing, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so ADC nonlinearity is very hard to explain, and so I would try to, <laughs> to, to give some uh, some heat. Um, it took it, it took me a long time anyway to enter into this problem when I was in Planck. <laughs> it took him months, basically, to understand in detail everything. Um, so I, I, I would try to, to to be as clear as possible, but uh, it's it's kind of difficult. Uh, it was a difficult problem. So uh, you know that uh, data are digitized, and actually. Uh, the fast uh, samples, so Planck, you know, the, the, the scanning frequency was uh, 180 gigahertz, but we had some fast sampling with the electronics and on board, the data were, were coded. So the fast sampling was 40 times 180 hertz, basically, right? Uh, so we had the 40 uh, times uh, 180 hertz fast samples. They were each of those uh, coded with ADC. And then they were average over 40 samples, subsamples, if you want. You can, you can see an example here. Uh, this is a, this, the, the plot on the top here is an illustration of the, how it looked like the samples, the subsamples. Uh, and this is due, this shape is due to the electronic response, right? So each, each point here is a subsample. And to make a sample, you digitize each of the points with ADC and you average over 40 samples. Okay, and you have a, positive uh, priority, neg negative, positive sample, negative sample. So you know, data are modulated. This is why it has this shape. And this is pretty symmetric. Um, so the, this electronic response is the re result of the sum of a static term, so which is independent of the signal in here. So this is a static response of the electronics in absence of signal, plus this response multiplied by the amplitude of the signal. So here, for example, uh, 500 IDU. So this is the amplitude of the whole signal. You multiply this, those 500 IDU by this shape of the electronics, 
plus this static term, you get the electronic response. So each, remember, each of those points were digitized, okay, here. So if I come back, come back to the previous slide, you can see the digitization function. So this is the ADC response. If you have a perfect instrument, it should be perfectly, it should be steps, you know, with uh, the same amplitude exactly everywhere. And as you can see, obviously it's not the case. <laughs> so this is really the ADC nonlinearity. If you remove the slope here, you remove the slope, you get this shape, which looks, look, which look ugly, basically. Um, but this is typically the error you make when you digitize, okay? So the difference in the different steps. And you see here, this big gap, which is at the center here. Um, so basically, when you are here, you are missing one sample. So if, if you have a value which is coded around here, you just code the two values uh, the two ADUs here are the same value at the end, okay? All right. Because the data are moving a lot along the mission, you sample different points of this ADC, okay? You can see an illustration here of the repetition of the data around, uh, along the mission in this, uh, you know, uh, in ADU here, you have uh, how the data are distributed, the fast data actually are distributed along the mission. If you want to create the data, you have to know this shape, obviously, right? Otherwise, you are left with nonlinearities. Because if you have if you have a signal which varies in there, you have a different gain than if you have a signal which varies in gain in here, right? So this is a nonlinearity function, basically. You have to know this shape if you want to make this correction. The problem is that we didn't that we didn't measure that on the ground, so we have to guess this, this shape. Second, you have to know the electronics response very well. Second problem, we didn't know the electronics response before lunch to a, a good level. So we had to rely on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, during the CPD phase, basically, we had to measure that uh, accurately uh, from, from, from the flight, actually. So we had to guess the parameters um, from flight, and it was a very difficult problem. At the end, um, ADC, like I said, ADC, uh, non-linear ADC correction is, AD, is, is actually a non-linearity correction. You can you can really model that as an, an uh, after averaging the 40 samples in here, you can model that as a function, non-linearity function that you have to fit. And this is the shape. Those are the shapes of the different functions. The problem is that we have coupling of that with the four K lines. The 4K line emission, the microphonic I was talking about before, is adding to this shape. And the frequency of those microphonics is around 180 hertz. There was one at 200 hertz. There was another at 160 hertz, etc. You can see the frequencies in there. We had, we had a few. The problem, again, is that we didn't know the amplitude of the different lines. So we had to feed that from flight. Again, so it was it was very very difficult. Um, we managed to to estimate the ADC, um, the shape of the ADC from measurements we did at the end of the mission. So we had to to fit actually this shape here from measurements we did at the end of the mission from uh, warm data. Uh, there was a lot of uh, processing to get that, which I don't enter into details. And the electronics response was measured during the CPV phase. And we also had raw data every 100 seconds during the mission. It, it helped a lot to estimate the 4K, the phase of the 4K lines. OK, so but you know, um, we managed with this correction, we managed to, to, to have a pretty eff efficient correction. So you see the jackknife map for one detector six months apart without doing it. You can see, uh, you can see uh, here um, in uh, uh, bef before actually uh, any uh, ADC correction, you can see some effective gain in the data, which it lo looks like a varying gain across the mission. And after correction, we get a pretty flat answer here. Um, but I was saying that this detector was is a bit was um, uh, we had a pretty efficient uh, ADC correction. It's not the case for all detectors. 
Okay, so at the end, this is really a limitation of the of the correction. Um, I wanted to mention about bond pass mismatch, but I will go fast on that. So we, we had some different uh, mismatch of the the bond um, uh, during uh, you know for different detectors at uh, the same frequency, which leads into uh, different uh, effect, different gain for the different components as compared to CMB. Different amplitudes of different components uh, for the CM as compared to CMB, and in particular for the CO line, which uh, was hitting exactly at the edge of the the band in here, where you had the maximum uh, differences in the band shape. So we had uh, sometimes factor of two difference in amplitude of the CO uh, uh, component, uh, depending on the detector at the same frequency. Um, let me move. Okay, so it was an illustration of uh, the different different uh, amplitude for the galactic dust uh, of this, uh, so it's relative to the CMB uh, uh, and removing uh, the, the average um, for, for different detectors. And we managed actually to get a pretty a good fit from flight data of this, uh, this parameter. So I, I, let me just finish with that. This is just a summary of systematic effect after uh, correction in HFI and we are left so this is an evaluation of the, the, the amplitude of different systematics. And we are left actually with, with, uh, with uh, we were left with uh, remaining IDC uh, residuals, but at the level of the noise, basically, uh, you can see in here. So we managed to clean the data after iteration, different iterations at the level of the, uh, the fu fundamental noise. Um, for the, this fundamental noise actually was as you can see, this is not a straight line in here, and this is due to this uh, one over f, uh, unexpected one over f component that I mentioned before. So sorry about that being late, and uh, let me stop here. <laughs>